Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Olivia Clyer from the New Student Orientation Team, and I am excited to be with you today. This session is the Jesuit Values Panel. The Jesuit Values Panel will feature chaplains from Georgetown Ministries who will discuss the intersection between Jesuit values and life at Georgetown. Please note that this session will be recorded. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the closed captioning icon in Zoom. I will now turn it over to the moderator to begin this program. Thank you, Olivia, for that introduction. And hello, everyone. I hope you all are, all are enjoying this new virtual format of NSO thus far. I know that this is not the ideal way that you all wanted to be meeting each other, but we have had to adapt in ways that we had never imagined before this pandemic. With that being said, welcome to the Jesuit Values Panel. My name is Rimpal Bajwa, and I am a junior in the School of Foreign Service. I remember sitting in your shoes two years ago in the McDonough Arena, attending this very panel, thinking about how I was going to immerse myself in the Jesuit values that we are going to be exploring today. My freshman year, with the help of countless people in campus ministry and our very own Brahmachari G, I founded the Georgetown University Sikh Student Association, for which I served as a president for two years. For the past two years, I also served as a student leader for the Press Pause program, which is an interfaith series that features a different contemplative practice each week, allowing students to not only learn about diverse practices, but also experience them. And last year, I served as a secretary of the Campus Ministry Student Forum, a student-led advisory board for our diverse religious student organizations on campus. Through all these roles, I have worked very closely with campus ministry, both as a representative of my faith community and as a representative of Georgetown's larger commitment to build an inclusive community for students from various religious and cultural backgrounds, as well as those who do not identify with a faith tradition, encouraging students to appropriate these values in their own distinct ways. So, what does it mean to attend a Jesuit institution and to engage these values? Coming to the hilltop, I didn't quite understand what these Jesuit values meant or how I would incorporate them into my time here at Georgetown. To be honest, I didn't even know what a Jesuit was. But you will all come to realize, as I did when I was in your shoes two years ago, that this campus lives and breathes as Jesuit values. And as a result, student students come to subconsciously engage these values in their own unique ways. Georgetown University as an institution has evolved over time, but remains deeply grounded in a nearly 500 year old educational tradition inspired by St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus. That tradition lives on in the Georgetown community through the shared values that unite all his fellow Hoyas, such as cura, per, cura personalis and magis, these Latin phrases may seem enigmatic and obscure, but they are embedded into the very spirit of Georgetown. They are not rules to which you have to dilute your identities to conform to. Rather, they are shared principles that guide us to use our identities in the work that we do here at Georgetown and after we leave the hilltop. You come to love the good, the bad, and the ugly here at Georgetown. By that, I mean Healy Hall, the countless all-nighters you will inevitably pull and the truly brutal, brutalist structure that we all know as Lao. You will also come to realize that there's a sense of pride that comes along with being a Hoya. But with that also comes a great deal of responsibility. Like our identities, Georgetown Je Georgetown's Jesuit character is not a stagnant identity. Rather, it is a dynamic one. We have seen students rally together to challenge this university on the basis of these Jesuit values, calling the institution itself to reimagine better ways that it can commit to its own principles. Students have organized sit-ins for days outside of the president's office, garnered mass support for historic referendums, shut down the streets by walking out, and so much more just to compel the administration, faculty, and fellow students of Georgetown University to imagine the ways these values are leading us forward as an institution and as a community. Georgetown is not a perfect place, but it is a place where we students can reflect on our own journeys and grow in the process of doing so. We do not have to embark on this endeavor alone though, for there are countless resources available on campus to support us in these journeys. 
In fact, Georgetown boasts some of the world's best resources in the form of our very own campus ministry chaplains, who we have present with us here today. Today, some of our chaplains have joined us to share their understanding of these values and reflect on how their own religious traditions engage and illuminate these values. Because students in the Georgetown community come from many different backgrounds, we recognize that this panel and our chaplains do not represent every identity here with us today. However, as I quickly realized from my time here at Georgetown, our chaplains are here to serve all members of our community, regardless of how they may identify. They are here to listen and support all of us in our unique journeys, whether it be over the delicious free, emphasis on free, snacks and tea during chaplain's tea, or by simply making themselves available to help us grow during our time at Georgetown. And with that, I would like to first introduce Father Greg Shenden, who is our Catholic chaplain and director of campus ministry. Father Greg graduated from John Carroll University in, in Ohio and Loyola University in Chicago and the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, California. Father Greg was ordained in 2008. Today, he will talk about the Jesuit value and excuse my Latin, ad maiorum de gloriam. That was perfect Latin, Rimpal, so thank you for that and for the introduction and for the welcome. And if I can just echo what Rimpal said there in welcoming you all, this was not necessarily how we intended to come together for this panel, but we're doing so. And Rimpal, you said something uh, I think really, really key, especially as it plays into this first value of ad maiorum dei gloriam, uh, for the greater glory of God, you mentioned just a few moments ago to adopt new ways. And I think that's so much a part of this overarching motto of the Jesuit order and of our institutions. When we speak of for the greater glory of God, what does this mean in practical terms for each of us uh, individually and collectively and in this given moment of dispersion? Um, we have to go back in some ways, I think, for that in order to recognize Ignatius of Loyola himself. Uh, as Catholics, we love patron saints. We have patron saints for every occasion, including the Wi-Fi. And, and I like to often call Ignatius of Loyola the patron saint of Plan B, Plan C, and Plan D. Uh, because throughout the course of his life, starting with uh, uh, the Battle of Pamplona when he was injured by a cannonball, Time and again, Ignatius faced great adversity and great setbacks. And time and time again, he had the gift of discernment. And I think that's key to understanding this value, uh, to discern when one door shuts, there's always another path open. And that's very much what we were founded on 500 years ago with that cannonball at Pamplona. Uh, in some ways, we would not be here today if it wasn't for that adversity in that moment for Ignatius. But this notion of discernment, if you listen to that phrase again, for the greater glory of God, notice Ignatius is not saying for the greatest, it's not about being perfect, but he's always allowing that room within reflecting on who and in Ignatius's worldview, whose one is, so as to live more fully out of that. It's that notion of discernment in recognizing I've got two goods here. Maybe I'm choosing and looking at two different universities to attend for the next four years. And which one is going to be the greater uniquely for me? All of you have been through that discernment in these past months to arrive here at Georgetown. That's not something that occurs just once in one's life, but is an ongoing process. Ignatius calls himself the pilgrim because he recognized life as a journey, always unfolding. And it was always that unfolding into adopting new ways of living. Uh, that notion of what's the greater in this unique moment. Uh, just one other brief mention, what really comes across with Ignatian, uh, Ignatius and the greater glory is this notion of dreaming. Ignatius was a big dreamer, uh, he was idealistic. And he lived fully out of that in discerning throughout the course of his life as we do here at Georgetown. With that, I turn it back over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Greg. Next up, I would like to introduce Reverend Ebony Grissom, who is our Interim Director for Protestant Christian Ministry. She's an ordained American Baptist minister and graduated from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, 
the Providence College in American Studies and completed her seminary education at Duke Divinity School with a concentration in gender, theology, and ministry. Today, she will be sharing her understanding of the Jesuit value, contemplation in action. Thank you, Rempel. St. Ignatius uh, believed that prayer and reflectivity should go, should so guide our choices and actions that um, our activity becomes a way of entering into union with and praising God. Um, that's on our, our website, so you can find that easily. I am uh, a Baptist, as you heard, and I agree with St. Ignatius. Perhaps you know that Baptists are all about freedom. Uh, Walter Sheridan, who I would say is our patron saint of freedom, distills our core beliefs into four basic freedoms, and among them is soul freedom. Um, there, we believe that um, each one has the right and responsibility to uh, converse with God as uh, they see fit um, and as a way to develop their relationship, one's own relationship with God. So basically, that means one is free uh, to approach God directly. Through prayer, we can hear, reflect, discern, and discern the direction to which God is calling. Prayer is a conversation with God, and this conversation consistently intentionally draws one into deeper relationship and closer to God. I interpret contemplation and action as careful reflection and discernment about where God is calling me to act, where God is calling all of us uh, to act. Our action could take shape from the work of our hands and it could be to be still and know that God is God. Whether physically strenuous or spiritually challenging, emotionally engaging, it's all work. Contemplation in action is the constant discernment about where God is acting and speaking in the world and then where and how one can participate. So one could enter prayerful reflection and contemplation for the obvious major decisions. Um, what career path should I choose? Is this the right relationship? Should I wear a mask? Um, but one could also happen, um, or this kind of discernment could happen in the seemingly mundane choices we make daily. Where should I eat? Uh, what's the best way to get where I'm going? What color mask should I wear? Especially in cases where there's not a clear moral, morally wrong decision or a decision that's good or bad, um, as we've heard instead, it's which one is modest. Contemplation moves our action, contemplation enlivens our action uh, and the ability to act and inspires and sustains our action for the greater glory of God. Thank you, Reverend Grissom. Next, we have Rabbi Rachel Gartner, our Jewish chaplain and director of Jewish life. She graduated from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College and is the author of numerous opinion pieces appearing in the Huffington Post, The Hill, and The Washington Post, and in National Jewish Justice Media. Rabbi Rachel will share, share her reflections about the Jesuit value, people for others. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Shabbat Shalom for those of us who are celebrating this Shabbos and welcome to, to everybody from all backgrounds. I'm delighted to be here as such as it is with you today to talk about uh, the value of people for others. I love this, this core Georgetown value both on its own merit um, and for the way that uh, Father Pedro Arupe included this as a core um, Jesuit value in the 1970s. And it's also particularly powerful for me because it resonates with an ancient Jewish teaching that I've held very dear for a very long time and then is written on the walls across Macomb, our uh, Jewish gathering space in the Levy Center near Starbucks. Um, so you can go find this slogan on our wall um, when you come back, when we actually come to campus. And that slogan is an ancient Jewish teaching from Rabbi Hillel that says, If I am not for myself, who will stand for me? Very important, right? Of course, to stand for the values and the people that are closest to us. But the next line of the text says, 
Uchsha ani laatzmi ma ani. And if I am only for myself, what am I? Not who am I, but what am I? What have I become if I only stand for myself and not as a person for others? V'im lo achshav ematai. And if not now, then when? My dear friend, uh, Father Shenden said to me that many Jesuits are now saying, not only think, considering this value as a value of people for others, but people for and with others. Indeed, we all share this core religious value to both stand for others in righteous solidarity and to stand with others in deep empathy, to walk with others in their struggle for justice and with others in their struggle to be understood and honored even across real difference, real social difference, racial difference, political difference, cultural difference, sexuality difference, geographic difference, ability difference, religious difference, gender difference, you name it. In this day and age, not only can we, but we must work tirelessly for social healing through standing with and for each other that is not reliant on social homogeneity. Social healing, not reliant on social homogeneity. I think that's what it means to be people for and with one another today. So uh, to be a, um, an upstanding member of this remarkable community, uh, let's ask ourselves, what does it look like for me to be a person for and with others? For me, that means we need to consistently wear masks and diligently practice social distancing, wherever we are. Um, we need to practice kindness with ourselves and with those with whom we share small places in our apartments, in our homes. We need to increase our capacity to be for and with one another by seeking out the emotional support that we need to show up for others and to offer emotional support to others. And to my mind, we need to vote. We need to vote. So we are, all of us here, your chaplains and your campus ministry community to help you discern moment by moment what it means for you to be a person for and with one another. Thank you, Rabbi Rachel, for your beautiful words. Moving on, we have Imam Yahya Hendi, who is our Muslim chaplain and director of Muslim Life. He is the first full-time collegiate Muslim chaplain in the United States and is celebrating his 22nd year at Georgetown. Today, Imam Hendi will talk about interreligious understanding. Imam, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Salam alaikum, shalom, shabbat shalom, peace be with you. It's my honor to be with you this afternoon. My friends, before I talk about my value of interreligious dialogue and relations and understanding, I want to acknowledge that it is, we all know, it is a very challenging time. Time with so many challenges, you know, the issue of uh, the pandemic that we have to deal with, uh, racism, the partisan politics we are uh, witnessing in an election season, increasing poverty, unemployment in, in, in our country here and around the world. I know, we all know, these are not easy times. But that's exactly why we need to talk about this amazing, important value, interreligious understanding. Actually, we learned in the last few months that what affects one person affects all. What Imam, I hate, to, I hate to interrupt you, but your paper's blocking your camera. I'm sorry. There you go, yeah. You know, what affects one affects all. What undermines one undermines all. This is why this interreligious understanding value is important. It teaches us that... Um, we need to find a way to work with one another. We need to be united. And we learned that we need to be united. In my tradition, it talks about come to a mutual understanding between us and you. The Quran talks about the need to ta'arafu. We need to come to know one another. We need to work with one another. 
antanafaso. We need to compete with one another in the doing of good. So those challenges that human family is facing now, it brings us together. We learned that we have much more in common than we have differences. Actually, the rabbi and a priest and I taught a course at Georgetown University called Interreligious Encounter. And imagine having three, three clergy from different religious traditions working together, teaching together, to discover that, yes, we have differences. And we have unique differences that may separate us. However, what unites us is more than what separates us. We learn in that course, and we learned that we need to find a way to find common grounds to bring us together. You know, interreligious understanding for me informs the way forward. It teaches us that the clash of ideas is the sound of freedom. It teaches us to work together on what unites us. My friends, in the years ahead, we will find every way to engage you, to work with you, so that you may learn not only about your own religion, but other religions as well. I promise you not to convert you. I promise you not to force you to become I or to become here or that. Not to give up on who you are, but rather to know the best of who you are. Actually, you know the best of you are and what you are and who you are when you learn about others from others. We also in this, in this troubled time, we need to know that there is much that separates us shaped by misconceptions. Interreligious understanding at Georgetown University allows us to confront those misconceptions, to find a way to learn about someone else from within and not only from without. We will help you not and, and work with you, not to tell you what to think about religion, but how to think and why you need to think about not only yourself, but also others. We will accompany you in your journey. Find the time to, to participate in religious activities of another tradition. Find the time to zoom in a program organized by each religious tradition. You will never have this anywhere in America and the world, where you will be able to attend so many religious activities and services and informative sessions that will teach you about the big world of which we are a part. We're here together united because united we stand and divided we fall in this troubled time. So something to keep in mind that interreligious understanding is a Jesuit value, but it is also a Jewish value. It's a Christian value, it's a Hindu value, it's a Sikh value, it's a Baha'i value. It's a universal value, a value that tells us, let us come to understand each other from within, not only from without, and find common ground to work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imam Hendi. Next up, we have Father David Pratt. The Very Reverend David Pratt is the Orthodox Christian Chaplain and Director of Orthodox Christian Life. Father Pratt completed his PhD at the University of Louvain previously served as a U.S. military chaplain for 23 years, years and has a been a professor of ethics for the past 10 years. Today, Father Pratt will talk about community and diversity. Thank you, Rim Paul, and thank you to your team for putting this together and allowing us to be in front of the entire new class. Uh, greetings to all Hoyas. Slava ti me boja, slava ti bie. Doxasi Kyrie, doxasi, glory to you, O God, glory to you. I'm in a church in Washington, D.C. I'm here because, well, quite frankly, there's a funeral that has to be conducted. I'm here because I'm doing a community duty. The deceased, God bless him, he was a poor person. He doesn't really have a family. We're still looking for his relatives, but we will take care of his funeral. We will take care of him. It's a community duty. And I would like to tell you now, as a chaplain of Georgetown, of which I'm very proud to be a part of, unlike Imam Hindi, I want to convert you. I want to convert you to compassion. That's right. I want to convert you to compassion. 
because my other colleague is gonna to speak to you about care in just a moment, so I won't rob from him. I wanna turn you towards compassion because if you attain compassion, you will be a great Hoya. If you attain compassion, you will have what's needed in community and a community with compassion can take care of its diverse elements. It can care for its poor. It can be responsible. It can be all the things that we need right now. I won't repeat what my colleagues have said. They've said it really well, better than I can. But I just leave you with this. Turn to compassion and you will have a great experience at Georgetown. Turn to compassion and the world around you is going to be a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Father Pratt. Last but surely not least, we have Brahmachari Sharan. Brahmachari Sharan is a director for Dharmic Life and also serves as a Hindu spiritual advisor. He's also an adjunct professor in the School of Foreign Service. Brahmachari Ji completed his PhD from the University of Edinburgh and is the first Hindu priest and monk to serve in a Catholic university. Today, he will share his understanding of the Jesuit value, care for our common home. Sister Paul Rampalji, thank you very much. Um, namaste to all of you, my new Hoya sisters, brothers, and non-binary kin. I get to discuss a brand new Jesuit value, caring for our common home. Uh, Pope Francis uh, published an encyclical entitled Laudato Si on care for our common home in, uh, on May 24th, 2015. And when Father Arturo Sosa became the Superior General of the Jesuits, a commission was called and they selected four universal apostolic preferences to guide the work of the Jesuits in their service of the mission of the church from 2019 to 2029. The fourth of those was chosen to be caring for our common home. This answers the 2015 call of Pope Francis by drawing from Catholic theology and social justice theory in order to highlight the plight of God's creation. It's a timely and important value. I understand it a little bit differently, however. In the philosophy of my tradition, God didn't create this world. Uh, for us, the multiverse evolved approximately 16 billion years ago in the play between matter and antimatter, vyakta and avyakta in Sanskrit. And in due course, the billions upon billions of stars, galaxies, and planets followed. Human beings are a life form that evolved on this planet of ours, but just one amidst millions of other animal and plant life forms. Yet, as we industrialized and developed, instead of caring for our fellow life forms and honoring the billions of years it took for Mother Nature to develop this diversity of life, we abused, we exploited, and we manipulated her and all of her children. Yes, we our human species. And as if that wasn't enough, we then turned our weapon of progress against members of our own species, whilst letting the crocodile chair of justice flow just in us to convince us that we were doing well overall. I'm a forest monk. For our way of life, there is no space more sacred than a forest, no festival more beautiful than the diversity of life, no institution more just than the universal pursuit of holistic equity and betterment. No call to prayer more soulful than the sound of free flowing fresh water. And no news more inspiring than the knowledge gleaned from the experience of generations with the natural world passed down from parent to child, from group to group, from sibling to sibling, from experts to seekers. You see, for me, there is no God who will save us from our own mess, the mess that humankind made of this planet as we sought to civilize and, de and develop. But there is us. We are called to this value. You've heard where I'm coming to it from, and you've heard where the Jesuits come to this from. And I hope that you can see where you will come to it from. It is important because of its inherent imminence. So we must care compassionately for our home, in our every action. This is true what we call karma yoga or the path to oneness through mindful action because if not us, dear Hoyas, who else will? Thank you and welcome to Georgetown. Thank you very much Brahmachari Ji and thank you all for sharing your thoughts and reflections. Now we are moving on to the Q&A portion of this panel. 
I would now like to invite you all to ask some questions that you may have regarding the Jesuit values or simply to the cha chaplains of campus ministry by using the Q&A function on Zoom. I ask that you use this time to ask concise questions and avoid submitting any comments or opinions. And so for the first question, this is actually for Father um, Shenden. What does campus ministry offer those who do not identify with any religious tradition? Uh, thank you, Rinpoche, and thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to lean back into something you said there, Imam, a few moments ago in terms of talking about all of these values of which we are speaking today, and we do talk about them here as Jesuit values, but Imam, you always point out something really, really, I think, incredibly important, is that these are not specifically Jesuit values or Christian values or Jewish values. These are universals. Uh, and I think that's a big part, and especially when we talk about, you know, in terms of who we are and how we live out of that in campus ministry, uh, in terms of what we do in terms of folks of certain faith traditions and folks with no faith tradition. Uh, I think what we're here for is um, for anybody uh, here on campus uh, is to empower you know, I, I, one of the, the hallmarks of, I think, of a Jesuit education is not that we're going to tell you what to think. I think one of the hallmarks of Jesuit education is we're going to invite you to think. And I think that's what all of us here at Campus Ministry really, really see uh, at, at the fore of, of what we do uh, as, as ministers here at Georgetown is we invite people into, because if I tell you what to think, there's no freedom really ultimately in that. We're here to empower and that's at the core of Ignatius's spirituality. The purpose of, for Ignatian spirituality, the purpose is to lead an individual, whoever that individual is, to deeper spiritual freedom, coming to recognize more fully who you are and living out of that. That's who we are, that's who we are for everybody here on campus. Thank you, Father Greg. Um, and so the next question is actually for Rabbi Rachel. Uh, someone asked, how can students access religious services virtually? I'm trying not to laugh because in my home, we, we call me the, um, the virtual cave person. And now you're asking me the virtual, <laughs> the tech question. Oh my goodness. Okay, here's what I can tell you. And then anyone who can, wants to add, please. Um, we're doing them. They exist. Every tradition has some version happening of virtual services. For example, I can tell you for Shabbat, Friday nights, 5 p.m. Eastern time, we are, we are broadcasting and then we are going to rebroadcast at Pacific time later, later in the evening, I believe. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, or somebody put in a chat if I'm saying something wrong, but I think if you go to the campus ministry website, there is a way to access religious services for every tradition online. And I will just say right now to those who are curious, this is my shofar. I want you to know I will, we will be blowing shofar. There will be Jewish High Holy Day services coming up virtually and otherwise. So please do, do join, join us. Thank you, Rabbi Rachel. The next question is for Reverend Grissom. Someone asked, how can we schedule a meeting to talk to any of the chaplains? Thank you, Rimpol. Thank you for the question. Um, all of the chaplains have calendars where you can uh, go directly uh, to the link, either from our, I think from our um, campus ministry page, but also, um, in our newsletters, in each individual newsletter, there are links. And you could also email each of us directly or the person, the chaplain with whom you would like to speak. So there are lots of ways um, to reach us. We look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Rev Grissom. Next, this one's for Imam Hendi. For all of you, how do you coexist with such differing and often conflicting viewpoints? by keeping in mind that the clash of ideas is the sound of freedom. You know, in the Quran, it teaches that if God had wanted 
God would have made all of us the same. So God made us different. The challenge of humanity is to find ways to coexist with difference, to find ways to learn about that differences do not mean animosity. It does not mean that we are to be at the throat of one another. So learn about others from within, uh, listen to others, master the art of listening more than the art of talking, engage with people of different traditions by being present in their events and learn about them from, from them. Thank you, Mom Hendy. And this one, once again, is for Father Greg. If someone wants to explore a religion not their own, what programming events, opportunities would you most recommend we attend? I think, uh, and again, thanks for the question. Of the very unique uh, opportunities here at Georgetown University is the diversity of our campus ministry and that we have uh, services in such a variety of traditions. One, one thing I always I say each year to first year students is um, if you grew up Catholic, uh, on Friday go to Shabbat. You know, if you, if you grew up Jewish, you know, go to Juma. You know, if, and so on. Rarely in one's life is one placed in a, a, a situation with such an opportunity to have all of these various religious traditions represented with their various services and other events, be it, you know, um, well, Imam does like to cook from time to time, or so I'm told. He's st I'm still waiting uh, for you to cook for me, Imam. But uh, again, there are these opportunities, both explicitly uh, in sacred settings with our religious uh, services, but also in other opportunities with all of our, uh, all of our faith traditions to encounter what each of these faiths are really about. And just to lean back in onto something Imam said, in these, in these times where, uh, you know, we have, you know, the virtue of dialogue and the virtue of listening is something that is becoming more and more countercultural these days. And I think here at Georgetown, we offer uh, explicitly these opportunities, both in terms of getting to know our, our various uh, religious leaders, but also in terms of uh, really discovering what faith traditions, different faith traditions are all about. So I think there are plenty of opportunities to do so. Uh, Father Greg, I want to say this, that I was at Leo on Thursday, uh -huh. and soon I will announce uh, cooking with the Imam, and maybe we can make it cook with, with campus ministry. Uh, there we go. To a station for us open to stream live cooking from Leo. Perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> That's interreligious dialogue. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Father Greg. Um, the next question is for Rabbi Rachel. Uh, the question is, how do we keep faith in humanity and the future when it seems like so much is going wrong in the world right now? Oh, that is a big one. Um, I'll start by saying you don't want to cook with me. You don't want cooking tips from me. Your challah will not be good. But our students are great at it. <laughs> um, but to your question, I, I think it's so, that's a beautiful, beautiful question. And um, I, th I, would, I think for each of us, probably the sources of hope are different. Um, I'll tell you what comes to mind, what comes to mind for me right now, a couple things. We have two prophets in Judaism, Miriam, the prophet who was um, able to find water in the desert when no one else could, she could look deeply into the moment and see and find where there was richness and nourishment and sustenance. And I think of her a lot and that, that intentionality to look in deeply and closely into the moment and see where there is blessing. So last night at our Shabbat table, I just looked at my family and said, wow, my God, thank God. Um, where's the good that is happening right now on the streets and in our homes and in our lives? Uh, even, even with the, the, when the terrain feels like a desert sometimes. Um, 
And the second is Elijah. The second prophet I think about is Elijah, who is a herald of what is to come, a better moment, a better moment, right? To balance what is now and a better moment. And for Elijah, it's all about getting there. It's all about looking forward. And for me, how do we go from here to there? How do we redeem a difficult moments? Is, uh, how do I keep hope alive is that I say, I'm going to use what I'm seeing and learning in this moment to fuel me towards a better time, both the good and everything that is in desperate need of transformation. So for me, redemption always comes from taking a difficult time because they're inevitable and making the changes that we need to make, to make it a better time for everybody. Um, I think that's what I'm, what I'm focusing on right now. Thank you, Rabbi Rachel. The next question is for Reverend Grissom. How and with whom can non-denominational Christians connect? Thank you. Uh, Non-denominational, easy for me to say, Christians are Protestant, so that would be me. Uh, I would love to hear from you. You have a few ways that you can do that. Uh, First, I would I recommend that you sign up for our newsletter. Uh, We send a newsletter uh, to our community every week. Uh, You can also, again, email me directly. Uh, There's a link in that newsletter. And then there's also one for our Christian Life Coordinator, Michael Haycock. So in any of any or all of those ways, um, you can um, you can connect with us. We have our worship services on Sunday night at 7 p.m. Sunday night East. Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern. So we look forward to see you, seeing you. Thank you, Reverend Grissom. Uh, the next question is for Brahmajariji. Can students meet with chaplains of traditions other than their own? That's a great question. Um, I mean, look, at Dharmic Life, um, we have myself as a Hindu spiritual advisor, but I also serve uh, to connect six Jains and Buddhists uh, with representatives of their own traditions. However, um, the great thing about campus ministry is that we are here for everyone. Uh, Imam usually leads with the line that when he was hired, he was uh, he asked, well, what do you want an Imam here for? There are only so few Muslims here. And uh, the Jesuit who hired him said, well, I'm asking you not to be uh, the Imam for Muslims. I'm asking you to be the Imam for the entirety of Georgetown. So anyone can discuss anything they wish with uh, chaplains. And I would just say, um, I used to teach at uh, the University of London. Nobody gets the chance uh, to interact with such a diverse group of people um, in a university setting. The time when we have those kinds of questions that pertain to the world, um, especially when, you know, religion is uh, seen uh, quite rightly in some instances as the cause of a lot of the wrongs in the world. So it is the best thing to get a chance to speak uh, with people who are informed um, and try and get more of a perspective so that we become well-informed individuals rather than, uh, you know, tabloid readers only. Thank you, Brahmajari Ji. The next question is for Father Pratt. How should we go about attending different religious services without feeling like we are committing blasphemy or going against our own religion? Father Pratt, I think you're on mute, yeah. That's an important question. And the questioner, I will say, it reflects a a certain degree of sensitivity, and so I appreciate that. It's good to know that Hoyas can ask beautiful and wide-ranging questions, even as they've just begun to join the campus. I think, first of all, you can come with great trust in our campus ministry and all of our doors are open. I can say that with confidence. Um, My colleagues, from what I've seen in my two and a half years, going on three years now, I have no doubt that your needs can be taken care of, whether you meet us in an office setting, uh, in a chapel setting, and of course, now online. I think we can deliver exactly what is needed for you. As for the question of blasphemy, that's tricky. I think when you're, and I'm going, to give a, I'm going to give a careful answer on this. I think when you're in university, there, you come into a community where there is a, an understood degree of openness, where things that would be blasphemous elsewhere 
become not so with us because it's part of our learning and it's also part of our growth. One thing that's going to happen in the next four years is you will learn a lot, but you're going to grow a lot. And I'm just so happy to be a part of it in my own small way. And in that rubric of learning and growth, I think there's very much less that what would, what would be called blasphemous in that setting. And thank God, I think we need a little less blasphemy and condemnation and a bit more compassion as I argued earlier. If I could put in a plug for something that is very important for me and all of my colleagues, because they're really good at it, and that's discernment. The one thing that we can help every single Hoya, regardless of religion, is we can help you with decisions, to make decisions about your life and about your future. Here's why. Discerning is an art. It's also a sacred art. And my colleagues are excellent at that. I will not include myself out of humility, but I know it can happen in campus ministry for you. And I would say an important decision such as what are you gonna be and what are you gonna do in the future? That is so important. It needs discernment. It needs the art the sacred art. Father Pratt, I would just like to say, in, uh, I, I appreciate and am consoled by your humility, but I would also like to say that you are an incredibly discerning individual as well. So thank you for that and being part of us. Thank you, Father Pratt. Um, and the next question is for Brahmachari G. How can we use faith to help deal with the solitude that comes with being in a global pandemic? Hmm, now that is a tough one. Um, and people, you'd expect people like, uh, you know, followers of my tradition who have uh, deep experience with meditation, you know, to be completely chill in this pandemic and have absolutely no problems. I can guarantee you they are just as perturbed as everybody else. Um, faith, if you have a relationship or if you have this notion of something greater than yourself, if you have a, a relationship with God, then faith can be a very powerful accompaniment for you uh, as you walk through this uh, pandemic time. As a meditator, uh, coming from the meditative traditions, you know, something was very nice. We center ourselves on breath every day. Every time we meditate, we use the breath to, uh, to center ourselves. And it dawned upon me that, especially with our focus on breath and aerosol and everything uh, because of COVID, that actually every breath I have taken in is a breath that some other living being has breathed out. And every breath that I breathe out is going to form part of the breath that some other living being takes in. So even though we are in our little boxes in front of our Zooms or in our rooms, we're still being sustained by others and others are sustaining us. Just keeping that in mind, I think helps us find so much connection with the broader universe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariji. That was beautiful. Um, and this is actually the last question. Uh, and this is for Father Greg. How can students practice community values while not being on campus? Uh, and thanks again for the question. In some ways, uh, I defer to Brahmachari's uh, beautiful words, but you, you, you said it right there, Brahmachari, when you said, you know, even though we are in dispersion, we're still being sustained by one another and vice versa. Just to lean back into uh, something I said early on, um, when St. Ignatius and his companions first founded the Jesuits 500 years ago, they didn't all stick around and stay together, they, they dispersed. and. Uh, from there on out, in many ways, we've been a community of dispersion. Uh, you go back to Ignatius, and he, he was big on letter writing. In fact, in the 16th century, of any collection of letters we have historically for any human being, uh, the largest number of letters from a single individual is St. Ignatius. He was always writing to others through the course of the years. Uh, if Ignatius and his companions were around today, they would certainly be using Zoom. Uh, it is a matter of staying connected in the midst of dispersion. Um, these values, yet again, um, and as Brahmachari said, we're still connected in spite of dispersion. These values are something, be it caring for one another, cura personalis, be it that notion of majus that you heard some of us speak of, the more it's 
it's challenging and encouraging one another to live more and more fully out of themselves. To lean back to what Imam said earlier about listening, I think so much of this, and, and it will be uh, a bit more of a challenge. There will be more labor involved in listening and dialoguing given the dispersion. But I think it's very much a possible, it's, it, it's, we've seen it happen before, uh, and we can continue to live more fully out of this in this unique moment. Thank you, Father Greg, and thank you to the panelists for your beautiful reflections. Um, and thank you to everyone for your questions and for listening so patiently during the duration of this panel. Before we conclude today's session, I would like to leave you with this quote from Representative John Lewis's commencement speech to the Georgetown community in 2015. You have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate to get out there and leave this little planet a little greener, a little cleaner, a little more peaceful for generations yet unborn. As you may all may have noticed, we live in unprecedented times. So I urge you to reflect on this question. How will you engage these values to guide you through these times and make meaningful change in your communities? With that, thank you once again for listening and I hope you have an amazing rest of NSO. Before we end this panel, I would like to turn it over to Olivia once again to give you further instructions on what to expect next. Thank you all for joining us again for the Judgment Values Panel. Now you will be heading to another small group meeting with your orientation advisor starting at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Please visit the NSO Canvas course and click the OA group Zoom links to find your group's Zoom room. If you have any issues finding your group, please visit the orientation help desk also found in the Canvas page. Thank you and we will now end this session.